So hello and welcome to another talk on critical perspectives on technology. For those of you who do not know, my name is Katja Spiel and I'm an FWF Hertha Fremberg postdoctoral scholar at TU Wien, where I research marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. My pronouns are they, them, and my sign name is... This lecture series is part of my uh, research project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies and interaction design and uh, supported by the Human Computer Interaction Group at TU Wien, as well as the Faculty of Informatics. Uh, I will post the uh, slides in a second. If you have any other access needs, please feel free to just let me know. From next week on, I promise you I have a signed contract. We will finally have signed interpretation. It is happening. It was super hard. Um, anyway, you are here today to hear from Britta. Britta F. Schulte is a postdoctoral researcher at Bauhaus University Weimar in Germany. After finishing off their PhD on design fictions and their use in sensitive settings such as dementia care. In their spare time, they write stories, many of which feature robots. If they are not reading, writing or knitting, they make scenes such as their self-published Take Care Number One robots, Take Care Number Two, Technology, Dementia, and Care, and Don't Blush, Sexuality, Aging, and Design. Their presentation is titled Hashtag Age Sex Tech, Speculative Design for Intimate Encounters and Aging. So you can ask questions during and after the presentation in the chat window or however Britta tells you to. And afterwards, we will all be in a discussion led by Anna Dobrosovestnova who has a background in culture and film studies, as well as cognitive science, and consequently, consequently has formal and informal affiliations with the Angewandte, Theo Wien, and the University of Vienna. Anna's research interests include effective and relational dimensions of human-robot interaction, co-construction of identity in human-robot interaction, robot ethics, and participatory design methodology. But for now, Britta, take it away. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you will hear, I think, all of the hobbies that have just been mentioned um, represented in this talk. So I'm really excited about this. Um, I'll try my best to find my slides. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, can we move to the to the next slide? Then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. So first of all, I'm going to tell you who I am and why I think I can talk about this. I will talk. I'll tell you um, a bit of why I think speculation and storytelling are uh, incredibly useful tools for design and design research. I will uh, talk a bit about why I think aging and sexuality are important topics in this context. And then I'm going to uh, talk about kind of three case studies. So three um, design projects of mine uh, to kind of illustrate these points. At that point, I just realized when I spoke to it earlier, the inter the, um, after the last one, uh, the presentation will uh, stop uh, quite rapidly, but then I hope you all bombard me with questions and I'm really looking forward to discuss this further then. Can we have the next slide, please? Great. Um, on this slide, I try to summarize who I am in, in screenshots. Um, it tells you my name, it's, I'm Britta Schulte. I currently work as a postdoctoral researcher and te teaching assistant at the um, Human Computer Interaction department with Professor Eva Honecker in Bauhaus University in Weimar. Before that, I studied um, at UCL, University College London, in the Interaction Center. And I wrote my PhD with this incredibly long title, where I basically looked at design fiction as a method to look into sensitive settings. Um, or with sensitive settings, I mean, uh, things that are uh, topics that are both uh, complex and uh, kind of icky to discuss. And we'll talk a bit, about, bit more about that. And I did that at the example of uh, monitoring technologies for dementia care. If I have any energy left at the end of the day, I turn myself into Brief Michoud or uh, sometimes even Abby Calypso where I write short stories. 
and they used to be really dark, um, quite uh, kind of, you know, what can go wrong with technology dystopian, which is very cathartic, and I highly recommend that. But increasingly, I'm trying to be a bit more positive of what I want to do and to try to open up alternatives. Can we have the next slide, please? Right. Um, so what, why do I think speculation is useful? Um, I'm drawing here on a quote from a paper that I co-authored uh, on expanding modes of reflection in design futuring. And by design futuring, we mean a, different, a lot of different types of, of speculation, uh, critical design, speculative design, design fiction, um, all of this, everything that kind of tries to build up uh, alternative futures. And I think this can sometimes feel quite luxurious. I think most of us do research because we feel an urge, we have a need or a problem in mind that we want to solve. And interestingly enough, speculation does not do that. When you speculate, you don't necessarily want to build something that solves this problem. You don't want to build something that then goes into market. So why do you take time and energy to do this? I think that's in the second part of the sentence, where it's really about um, finding space, finding time for debate and reflection, uh, particularly. And I think that's very useful because a lot of what we do uh, individually, but also as a fear is kind of driven on assumption and taking time out of that and really kind of taking stock of where we are and where we are going, I think is incredibly um, useful and quite incredibly strong thing to do. Uh, next slide, please. And I think this also works um, not only for one individually, but also on a higher level. So I'm unfortunately not involved with this project at all, but I loved reading about it where they use design fiction snippets to talk to um, a manager uh, uh, in the maritime industry, I think. And they found it incredibly useful to um, give people the opportunity to find different perspectives about their own work, about their own area of expertise, and to start thinking about um, ideas within that realm. And for me, that has two reasons. So I think, um, well, I think we all know the, the, the power of storytelling. If you pick up a book, if you read a webcomic, if you watch a Netflix series, um, quite often you, uh, you encourage people you have never heard anything of, you don't know about anything about their life. But if the storytelling is, what is, is done well, you're kind of sucked into the story and you want to find out more about them. So I think that's, that's really important and, and really uh, urgent. And... One other thing I think about it is that in story, in, by having this, by having these artifacts, these stories, uh, design artifacts, whatever, um, you have something tangible, you have something that you can actually kind of grab and hold and take apart um, and engage with quite practically. But on the other hand, it's still something like a safe space because you do not have to reflect on your own work. You do not have to engage full on with what you're doing, you don't have to uh, consciously uh, address your biases uh, when you start with the process. And it's also quite useful to work with um, looking at the field, for example, HCI as a whole, because you don't have to take uh, your colleagues work apart. You don't have to say, I don't like this project or there's something wrong with this, but no, you look at this um, more generally. So you kind of have a tangible, but also a safe space. Can we go to the next slide, please? And I do that a lot around um, aging and increasingly looking at sexuality and intimacy. And it's always hard to tell where something started, but to some extent it started with this paper for me, um, uh, where I wrote a story that's called Homes for Life, in which I reflect or it's written from the perspective of a daughter who buys a smart home for her mother as an alternative for her care home. And 
we learn everything from how she first came to the idea to the end, um, all the all the nitty gritty details of, of how that played out. And I want to read you a quote of this. So once I got the notification that there was a man in her bedroom with her, I immediately called the police and they drove down and found the two of them, well, snuggling, if you know what I mean. I have no idea how she met this man, but apparently they knew each other quite well. I, I had no idea. It was really awkward, and I don't think we've spoken about it since. What must the policeman have thought about us? Not knowing this about my own mother? Well, I'm glad nothing happened. Gave us quite a fright, though. Next slide. And so how did I come up with this uh, snippet? Um, as I said, my engagement came from monitoring technologies in dementia care. And so these are three really random examples that I uh, took from, from a Google search on monitoring technologies. Um, there's plenty of devices like these out there. These, these are just to exemplify um, some of these points. We have a GPS tracker on the left, and I did a self-study of them, and they can tell you that they are really horrible. We have a house sender in the right, which kind of detects um, whether you're still moving around um, at the right times uh, during daytime, during nighttime, and so on. And I also tested one of those, and I can tell you they are really terrible. And in the middle, we have this very extensive system, which is a, basically a bed sensor. And this is where um, this little snippet that you just saw was inspired by. Because if you start looking at these technologies and ask, what if, what if they are actually used? How are they actually used? Um, for me, the question, so what if you lay down during daytime and what if you're not the only person there actually come relatively um, easily and quickly? But it's interesting, I think, that we don't see these technologies in, in that vein and we don't think about elderly people uh, when designing for them. And to me, that's very much grounded in the medical model which, with which we often see or with, we, with which we design technologies for elderly people, which very much foregrounds um, risks and problems um, and emphasizes the frailty of people. And there's two main arguments you often hear about these technologies. Um, the first of one, I heard a lot when I did an exhibition where I showed people, um, where I asked people, so what, what of these instances would you be okay with in your own smart home? What would you be okay with being monitored? Uh, for what purpose? Who would you share this with? And the, the most common response was, I don't want any of this, but it would be great for my father. So we kind of emphasize the needs of elderly people over their wants and desires. And the other, meant, uh, the other element, I think, relates quite strongly to uh, surveillance in general, which is the they don't have anything to hide uh, argument that I think all of us, if we look into our lives, we can discard quite quickly. I think we all have our little secrets, and that's actually potentially quite a good thing. So from all of this, um, a lot of my speculation draws on the question, what if we actually see elderly people as people with, uh, with uh, desires, with wants, uh, if we see them as desired and desirable bodies? And what does that then mean for our relationship to care and care technologies? Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Right, so let me give you some examples then of um, how that manifests in my work. And I want to start with, um, with twiddle moths. So I like twiddle moths. I have made them myself. So I want to put this first that I'm not dissing these as, uh, as a general. Um, they are... Uh, for those who don't know, they are quite, uh, some of them are made for uh, people living with dementia. They are often made by volunteers. Um, I have made some myself, and they are then again distributed by volunteers. They are literally uh, muffs that you put on your hands. They have the practical effect that you have your hands uh, are kept warm when you're sitting down a lot. That's actually quite a problem um, for some people. But they are also um, quite 
um, yeah, fiddly. So you have things to twiddle with. That's where the name comes from. Um, you have little bows, little buttons, um, different materials and so on. And they've been told to work and I have nothing against them. Apart from the fact that if you look at them like you look at them right now, I find them a bit infantilizing. They are all colorful and cheerful and there's a reason as to why that is. But I think sometimes we, oh, I think we don't necessarily have found um, the right design language to see what does this actually mean for adults. And so if we go to the next slide, I'll show you my response of taking this actually quite literally and looking at adults or naughty twiddle mouse. Again, this is speculative. So I'm not saying these are solutions. I'm not saying that they are better in any way or that they should be you know, mass produced and go out there. But I'm proposing them as, as tangible objects for us to kind of ask this question, what do we design for elderly people? What, feel, what do we feel conf confident with and what makes us uncomfortable and why? And so if you look at the one on the left, um, it's a black one, it's a bit punky. Um, I know my grandmother would have hated it because she was still of the generation to say uh, black is only for funerals. But I think with, with my generation, with other generations, that's going to change. Um, and again, it adds to the argument that I think we need to find new design languages for people um, growing up, growing old. They also have these uh, little spikes um, which I find quite interesting as an, as an aesthetic, as kind of a shock value, but also to ask some questions about risks and potential pleasure that we get from, from, from pressure, from, from subtle pain, um, or just from the idea of that. Um, the one in the middle is very, very different from that. Um, I really wish you could, you could feel that, you could touch that. It's made from an absolutely gorgeous, uh, merino silk yarn so it's very very soft it's uh, incredibly it feels very very rich um, but it has these kind of objects that really resemble boobs breasts um, which I wanted to uh, to explore how I how we feel about that and you can imagine them being on the outside but you could even more imagine them being on the inside so that you could actually kind of squeeze them, stroke them, engage with them, uh, kind of in the privacy of this twiddle mouth. I know that on, this is problematic on, on many levels, but I'm throwing it out there as a discussion tool as to why that might be. And then the one on the right uh, draws on the idea of, of laundry, of, again, rich materials, silk, lace, and so on. Um, and the, the, the colors that go with that, these little straps you have, I actually took from the um, sewing kit from my grandmother and I'm looking like that because that's where it is. Um, so these are things that she thought it would be interesting to keep and I find interesting to see, uh, to keep in mind of how many embodied interactions we have uh, at us, around us, where we might have some muscle memory and some memories of and with. Okay, moving on to the second um, project then. Thank you. So I want to talk about another project as well, uh, which is called the Intimus by Now, which first saw the light of day um, as the touch me in a provocation I wrote uh, for this last year. In this paper, I make the argument that a lot of what HCI research does around intimacy is happening between two people, is happening in private, and is based in a romantic relationship. Not all of this, of course, but quite a lot of it. Um, and I'm wondering if we can expand our understanding of intimacy. And to illustrate that, um, I wrote, I, I brought in um, three artifacts, Touch Me is one of them. And the idea of touch me is that you have um, this device, this artifact um, that you see in gray in the, uh, in the picture in the middle um, on your lap. And you can actually kind of, you can stroke it and uh, engage with it and then it will um, inflate. Um, it will may potentially warm up. So it will basically 
simulate your lab where it's sitting. And the idea is also that it will respond to your touch. So you could imagine it, I don't necessarily want to say moan, but somehow kind of responds as if it, the thing was um, turned on or pleasured by the touch. Uh, can we go to the next slide then? This is the uh, current iteration of this project that I'm building alongside the um, Reticare project, where we are looking into rethinking care robots and, and caring interactions. And so the idea is that you have this artifact lying on the table uh, in a care home, and you have two or more people engaging with it, stroking it, touching it, touching each other potentially, um, holding hands within the artifact, whatever uh, comes natural, makes sense. And the device kind of um, facilitates and enhances the interaction by responding to the touch, so it would vibrate. And it would also um, respond to uh, the stimulation as well. And so with that, I, um, I ask questions about what do we mean by intimacy? And um, I also want to, I've lost my train of thought there, sorry. <laughs> uh, thinking about intimacy, but also asking questions about acceptability as well. And the last thing will come to mind uh, when I go on. So in the next project, um, I'm going back to this again. And um, I want to talk about a workshop that I, that I held there, which um, draws the most on the idea of storytelling that I brought in at the beginning. So having done kind of all of this work, all of this work so far, it was at the point where I thought, okay, I really want to see if, if the, is this just me or is this actually a topic that's um, relevant to other people as well. And um, first of all, I got, um, we now exhibited the intimus to a couple of caregivers and there's a lot of interest there um, in, in care homes to kind of bring this topic to the forefront and engage with it. Um, but there's luckily also some research interest and um, together with the uh, wonderful core authors you can see here, um, we held um, a workshop at this last year to kind of start looking into this uh, further. And in this workshop, we wanted to use storytelling, but we wanted to, to go beyond what I said earlier. We didn't want to only talk about, we didn't only want to critique uh, what is going wrong at the moment. We did that at the beginning a bit, and it was really useful to kind of ground ourselves to find a shared vocabulary and to get in, to know each other. But then we wanted to write um, uh, utopian visions of sexuality, aging, and design. And we didn't only want to do that, we did it. And the participants have uh, blown us away with their creativity. And if we go to the next slide, I'll show you the example of the, um, the zine that came out of this. So this is a physical zine, this is a physical booklet. I have a couple of copies left, not much, but if you want one, definitely just let me know and I'll send it your way. And I want to give you, uh, want to quickly talk about the examples that came out of the stories. So there's one story that um, talks about uh, laundry and incontinence, but there's also quite a strong element of, of finding identity and changing um, identity in there, uh, making the point that I think is quite important that we do not necessarily stop with, with exploring ourselves um, at any point, um, but that it can actually um, expand to any age. We have quite a fun story uh, of which you can see the illustration in the middle, um, which uh, builds up these this fictional care home, which now offers sex care packages. And uh, it's, it's told from the, um, uh, from the position of uh, a person who kind of tells, has to tell the, or tells the children that uh, they are moving into this care home because of the sex care packages. It doesn't sound like such a big change, 
but I think it sounds quite quite hopeful and quite imaginative, uh, imaginable that we come to this point where we can talk about this openly and and make um, sexuality and intimacy intimacy an important part of life that we need to care for. Then we have a glorious story in there about um, sensuality around uh, menopause and how technology can support and enhance um, the whole life cycle of that. It's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's an incredibly rich story. Um, and fourth, last but not least, um, we learn about uh, Betty Hotwink, uh, an Instagram influencer, uh, very sex positive, who gets a birthday present, present from their granddaughter. And I think the, uh, the illustration kind of hints at to what that might be. Yeah, so these were the three examples I've brought with me. These are the, the main kind of points I wanted to make as to why I think storytelling is really useful, why I'd argue that storytelling should go beyond um, highlighting the negatives into the utopian, knowing full well that this is really hard to do, um, and where I think this, this kind of writing can offer new um, alternatives which don't have to be grand or amazing, they, they are the, not new alternatives world, but they are tiny changes within our world, and um, through that make it debatable if we want to go there or not, and potentially why we do not have them yet. That was me. Um, I'm really looking forward to discuss that with you, any questions you might have. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for the time so far. Thank you, Britta. That was uh, fantastic. And I have a whole lot of questions, but I would first welcome our participants to share their observations and their questions. And I see, Romy already posted uh, some reflection. Romy, you're welcome maybe to voice it if you want. Is Romy still here? Yes. Or if you prefer, I can read it. Uh, so Romy wrote in the chat, uh, just a quick thought on infantilizing. Um, I think there is something to be said about our understanding of being human and being a child and why do we find being treated as a child dehumanizing? So it's just a reflection, maybe you can respond to it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough one because the, these, these twiddle mouse, they are these colorful, and a lot of designs for people with dementia are these colorfuls because they kind of work. Um, people with dementia seem to like them. So um, I want to make this very, very clear that I do not, um, I, I see a lot of value that there is in, in the stuff that people put out there. But I'm, I'm sometimes wondering if we, and that's true for all the things I mentioned, I'm, I'm just wondering if we are stopping a bit too short, if we could push a bit further to come up with something that is still colorful, still attractive, but is not covered in ladybug buttons. And I'm also saying that because I think for some people that will absolutely be their aesthetic and what they like and what they have liked their whole life. For others, it would be a complete change of, of perception of presenting. And I think that would, be, that would be quite odd. So my question is, how can we, yeah, how can we find these design languages? And, and do we have to make these design decisions to, um, to be more inclusive, so to say, of, of what design for um, elderly people can be? 